I've just bought half of an Audi R8. Please stop. It's not as good as I thought it was. <laughs> But this car is something rare these days. Because it is a gated manual, that means we can actually try and bump start it. Oh, power! It didn't work. The Audi R8 is a car I'd always dreamed of owning. And if you're anything like me, you grew up watching Top Gear and seeing this as the first ever usable daily supercar. But at the time, it had a starting price of £80,000. And 10-year-old me never thought I'd be able to get one. But as the prices of these came down, even more so with this particular example, I had to snap at the opportunity. <laughs> but you can see this car is not perfect. We've got a lot of work to do here. And it is just cut out after not long. Don't think it was the battery. Hopefully it's just because it's run out of fuel. Now some of you may recognise this car because it was actually previously owned by Mark McCann who did some questionable things with it. And then We're missing more parts than we thought. So it's pretty obvious this car has not had an easy life. Mark bought it and very quickly got to stripping it and rallying it, but his dream was always to jump it. Now luckily, I've managed to get in there before he did that to it, and I'm here to save it and bring it back to life. And that is why it's currently in this state. But there is one good thing that came out of all of that. Here's fitted new adjustable suspension. I think they're BCs and that deletes the mag ride system which comes factory on this car. And that is known for causing loads of problems. How are we getting on back here? It's not quick. What, the car or the fuel? Well, the car without the fuel is definitely not quick. <laughs> right, take two. Let's see if we can get this started. And the first thing we've got to do with this car is get it washed. Because it's in an absolute state. And we are off. Sounds mint. It is hanging. <laughs> what do you mean? Now normally if we were going to clean a car in this state we'd like to cover off some of the bits and bobs like the ECUs for example but they need cleaning, everything is filthy so I feel like we're best off just going for it, don't you Thomas? Yes. So I mean, should we start with the wheels? <laughs> I don't even know where you start. <laughs> Let's just get the jet wash out. <laughs> this is gonna take ages. So with mud embedded in every crack, crevice and hole, we spent the next day cleaning this car as thoroughly as we could. So now the dirt is off it, we can see what is really up with this car and the damage goes a bit more than skin deep. So where do we start with this car? Well, somewhere around here, we have every part that Mark and his team took off the car after rallying it. Unfortunately though, storage has took its toll on some of the parts. So I suppose we need to reverse the process that they did, disassemble it and reassemble it, but do it better than it was before. And I've just realized it's blue. So the panels are the bit that's going to need to go on last. So the bonnet, the bumpers, the side skirts, all of that sort of stuff. The engine over here is not from this car. That's from the X3M project, which we've got going on at the moment. If you haven't seen that, link's in the top right hand corner. So I think we're going to start with the mechanical stuff. These are the anti-roll bar drop links, which go just here. And the reason they've removed those is to give the suspension longer travel and make it better off-road. But we don't want that. We want it to drive better on the road. So we need to find how they're going to go back on. Let's not waste any more time time and let's start rebuilding this Audi R8. So we can start by getting the car up on quick jacks outside but this didn't even go to plan. Well I was hoping that wouldn't be the case but because the engine's in the back when we try to put it on the quick jacks it's trying to teeter a bit so we're going to spin the quick jacks round and use them backwards because the engine is in the wrong but the right place. Makes sense? I'm sure some of you will have known that but it's something that some of you may not have so with the quick jack spun around it was much more sturdy and then we can take the wheels off and then start looking at fitting these drop links. Straight away a couple of things we've noticed is this bolt here is the wrong way around so that needs to be flipped around so we can put the drop link in here but also by them doing that, Nick this one's directed at you. And then 
I managed to push the headlight level adjuster out. So we need to bend that back on the bracket too, which is an easy fix. So swap bolt round, bend that back, drop link on. Good start. So with a few little tweaks, this corner of suspension should be pretty much ready to rock. All we've got to do, as I said, is swap that bolt round, get it pointing the right way, and then using the original nut off that is what holds the drop link on, and then we can pull the anti-roll bar down and then drop that into place too. And of course, you can't forget to ugga dugger it to spec. And after we took the suspension level sensor off, it was easy enough to tweak back into its home, and then we could do the other side. And whilst Tom tackled that, I thought this would be a great opportunity because we'd spotted there was loads more mud caked into the back of the suspension components, so that needed cleaning out as well, which is exactly what I did. Now, this car is going to take forever to get actually clean because the mud gets everywhere, so it's going to be a long task getting this back to how it should be. Both the drop links are now back on, but we've got a problem on this side because like the suspension level sensor uh, is damaged and there is no evidence of what colour goes to where on the plug because they've been ripped out right at the end. So if you have got an R8 and you can let us know which plugs go to which locations or a wiring diagram, that would be super helpful. But this side's looking much cleaner. I still need to do the other side, but in a second, we're going to start tackling some of the front end and see what we can do here. Now the dirt goes much further than just on the car. Every single trim and piece which they've removed is covered, so we thought we'd make a start on that. So now I want to try and start assembling the front of the R8. Now the problem here is we didn't take this car apart, so we have no idea how it goes back together. I have never worked on an R8 before, and I'm a little bit clueless really, but we can use logic to help us through this, I guess. What little amount of that I have. So I think what we're going to start with is the centre tub, the kind of boot section. So we have got that in the garage, but boy is it disgusting. It's got cobwebs, mud, maybe a little bit of mould going on in there. It's not pretty at all. And I don't want to be putting you know, nasty parts back on that car. I want this car to be mint when it's done. So I can now pull for my detailing arsenal. As we all know, I used to run a detailing business and very recently sold that. And with that, I still have a lot of stuff left over. So these drill brushes come in really handy in order to clean things like this because they take the effort out of scrubbing and really help get it very clean very, very quickly. So after we've gone over the carpet sections, we can also clean up the exterior part of it because this was all caked in mud as well. And after a good 20 minutes spent on it, it was then ready to go in the car, which was pretty self-explanatory. There's one electrical connector for a light and also then it just drops onto some locating pins and has a couple of bolts at the front. Then we can get on the windscreen scuttle trim, which does just clip under the windscreen, and then it has these kind of half turn locator bolt things. I think that's the technical name anyway. Next up is the side panels which go around here. This kind of works as part of the arch liner, so it's a little bit different to some cars, but again, this just clips into place and then uses those same locating bolts. And then the final piece is this kind of boot latch cover trim, and it, it's taking shape pretty quickly. Okay, so all the top trims are on. We're not 100% sure we're doing this in the right order, but we've got to try it to find out. It's the easiest way to learn. But these all look a little bit faded and nasty, so I'm going to try and restore them with... Uh, some of this. I don't know about you guys, but I just hate seeing bits of cars which just look tatty. And if they can easily be tidied up with a product like this, it's definitely worth spending the two or three minutes doing. But this car is covered with trims like this, which are faded and has loads of bits which look a little bit tatty. So there is going to be a lot of restoration stuff to do on this. But already, does that not look 10 times better than it did before? Now, we could just chuck this car back together and get it straight back on the road pretty quickly, really, considering we've got most of the parts that we need. But this car isn't perfect and I want to make it the best it can possibly be and there is a few things that need doing in order to do that because there is a bunch of parts like this which are just looking really really rough so I want to try and sort that out by giving this car that extra little bit of attention to detail and really tidying up all these bits which have got a little bit rough over the years so we're going to try and treat some of the rusty metal bits so instead of just chucking the car back together and getting it in one piece we're going to make sure that this car is top tier so let's spend a bit of time treating these worn out areas so we take a wire brush to the corroded brackets and anywhere else which is showing signs of rust then we can treat these with a brush on rust primer but I know the ideal situation here would be to send these parts off for blasting and powder coating but this is a process which takes really long and I want to try and do this as you guys could do it at home in your spare time. Now the product we're using is this POR15 rust preventative which you paint directly onto a surface after cleaning it and etching it. It's something that Tom has used before and he recommended it highly and I take his word above anyone's. But I think already it was definitely worth the time spending doing that but there's going to be a lot more things to do than just painting some rusty brackets. So if you guys have any tips on how I can tidy this up leave it in the comments. Right so it's 
now the next day and we've cleared out the garage of all of the parts for the Audi. And every single one of them was absolutely hanging, so we've given them a good thorough clean down. We thought you guys had seen enough cleaning, so we've done that off camera. And by doing that, we've noticed that pretty much every single part needs a little bit of paint to get them looking the best they can. Example one, example two, example three, four, and five. You get the drift. And that's got me thinking, what are we actually gonna do with this car? How's it gonna be when it's finished? What does the finished product look like? Well, I've got an idea, and it's slightly different to what we normally do here. Because let's face it, an Audi R8 is a budget supercar. Whether it classes as a supercar anymore is up for debate, but it is sort of the go-to car that people get when they want to modify a supercar. So it's been done a million times over. So am I gonna be able to do something that's not been done before and do it better? The answer is probably not, because it's all been done. They've been put on air ride, they've been supercharged, they've been turbocharged, they've been wrapped, they've been, you name it, it's been done. So how about this? Let's turn this into the prime version of what it should have been. Let's try and get it back to factory specification and get it as clean as possible using methods that we can do mainly at home. Let's try and build a really clean example of what is certain to be a future classic. Because this is the first version of the R8 that was ever made and it's a manual, surely that means that in years to come, this is gonna be a really desirable car. So I wanna see this car stand the test of time and I wanna see it looking good for years and years. And because this car is HPI clear, it is non-categorized, it's gonna be worth the full value. So I wanna tidy up all the little bits that are a little bit rough to turn it into that really nice, clean, original car. That's my idea anyway. Let me know what you think to that down in the comments section below because up until this point, mainly what we've been doing is modifying these cars. So maybe that'll be a breath of fresh air to all of us. But for now, we've got plenty of stuff to get on with. We can start, well, bolting it all loosely up to make sure everything's there, to make sure we know how it goes together so then when it's painted, it's an easy task reassembling it. It's not just guesswork, risking damaging those panels too. So the next thing to go on is that massive bonnet. Now this was actually surprisingly light, which is gonna be because it's made out of aluminium rather than steel. So with a gas strut on each side and the two bolts on each hinge, that was on the car. Now it's time for the bumper. So we can offer this up by just clipping it into place underneath the headlights. And already the front end's looking pretty good, but definitely not 100% perfect. There's more to do. Well, Tom, I'll let you do the honors. Do you want to bring the bonnet down so we can have a look? That ain't looking too shabby, is it? We need to sort out the panel gaps a bit, don't we? But yes. it looks pretty good. Oh. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Sorted. Yeah, nice. You can see here what I'm on about with the damage that's been caused. That one's, but yeah, there. The bumper is uh, missing a parking sensor. Got some scratch. That's, there's a bit of a panel gap Someone's there, mate. Someone's brute forced that. There's a little bracket. Okay, so. that's something we need to fix. It's just got a lot of little bits which need sorting out in it to make it that nice, clean car. I don't want to put the rear bumper on and it to be hiding all of this sort of mess. So, we need to strip this down. Looking lovely, mate. How can we clean all of the rust off? That's a great question. Well, in this video, we're gonna find out. Yes, we shall. Now, the idea of this build, in my mind, is to try processes that you guys can do at home. So, if you're working on your own car, you can use what you've learned here or what we've learned together to improve the standard of your car too. So, we're gonna try out some home remedies and old wives' tales on certain little bits of this to see what works best. But we'll come back to that a little bit later. For now, we can get the spoiler removed and also this bar which goes between the kind of two rear chassis legs and over the top of the exhaust. The reason why we're doing this is because we want to try and clean up that exhaust heat shield because it's not too bad, but definitely could be better and getting it off is going to be the way to do that, hopefully. So next off is the bat box brackets. So while Tom works on this, I was actually working on the trim which sits underneath the spoiler which looked a bit corroded. And the first thing I wanted to do with this is try and save this factory sticker. Unfortunately, it just came off in little bits and there was no way of saving that. Okay, so Tom has just made a founding while I've been working on some, a founding? A finding on something on here, on the exhaust heat shield while I've been working on something else. So these are the lower back box mounts. We've took these two off to try and take the heat shield off. But 
These ones we've just noticed have absolutely zero bolts at all. It's the same that size as well, isn't it, Tom? Yeah. But with now what we think to be all of the bolts out for the heat shield that we need to be able to remove it, we gave it a go, but it just wasn't coming off. There was something really stopping it. Right, we've had a slight change of plan on this heat shield. It's proving quite tricky to get off without taking loads of other stuff off. So we've got an idea for this later in the video, which we'll come back to. But for now, I've spent some time restoring this kind of under spoiler trim, which was kind of looking corroded and nasty, and is now looking much better. And also done these mesh trims as well. They were showing a little bit of kind of surface corrosion. So just a little bit of spray on a hammer right seems to have done the trick on them, bringing them back to life. And they are looking brand new. Now, one thing we overlooked in the previous video is we forgot to inspect inside the airbox because there's a high possibility that this could be full of mud and grass from Mark's field, and we were dead right about it. I'm pretty glad that we did that. <laughs> Look at the state of this airbox. All of that is parts of Mark McCann's field by the looks of it. <laughs> we've got grass, we've got mud, we've got everything. This definitely needs cleaning. And in order to do that, it's got to come off the car. So we've got to take off the lower section of the airbox. And to remove that, I think it was 413 mils and a couple of clips. So once they were off, we could take the airbox out and it revealed this mess. I'm seriously questioning at this point if this car is ever going to be back to how it was. How are we going to clean that then? <laughs> it just keeps getting worse. We thought we'd clean this pretty well. And now we're looking underneath it and even the bits that we cleaned aren't clean and the bits we haven't cleaned are even more not clean. Just look. Every single inch of the underside is coated with mud, all the gaps, everything. Hmm. The maddest part is that's just off two of the four under trays and that's just the loose stuff. We haven't even started cleaning it yet. It's a lot of mud. Hi, and welcome to Chris's kitchen. This is where we try out all the things which they tell you to do online, but you don't know if they're true or not. So I'm here to do the research for you. So today we have six crusty and rusty bolts and six dishes to try the home remedies in. So we've got some of the old classics like Coca-Cola and white vinegar, but then also some curveballs to try as well. I don't know which one of these methods is gonna work best, but we're gonna find out by the end of this video. So let's fill up each of the dishes with our test fluid to put the bolts in. And we've also got, is it electrolysis? Ele yeah. Electrolysis. And we've also got the electrolysis method to try it as well. So we've got seven tests, two brain cells, and six dishes. Let's do this. So an old classic, cola is the first to go. Then we've got white vinegar, followed by bleach, this is a curveball. Then we've got acetone, then soda crystals with boiling water, and then finally WD-40. So we're gonna leave these soaking in there for 24 hours, and if any of them are gonna work, I have no idea, but there's still one more test left to do. So we have our six test subjects in place. We're gonna leave these for 24 hours, I think, and see how they turn out. There is one which should technically work better, which Thomas is gonna tell us all about. So, I don't know, it's, what is it, electrolysis. We use soda crystals, it makes it more of an, like an electrolyte solution, and you pass the current through it, and it's supposed to take the rust off one thing and put it on another. Is it gonna look like we're cooking up something we could sell in the streets? Maybe, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Right, seeing as this is kind of the most involved method, we're gonna give it the most thorough test. So we've pulled a nice rusty bracket off the car, which is looking rusty. And we are now going to hook this up. So is it water and soda crystals in the tubware? It is, yeah. And then we connect a battery charger. Is it the positive to this? Positive to that. And then the negative to this? Yeah. Okay, it sounds sketchy. So we're going. Our seven different methods of bolt cleaning going. We're going to leave these for 24 hours and come back to them and you shall see the results near the end of the video. 
Let's get back to work. Right, so the next thing on the car is the interior. Now, this is full of a bit of mud. We're going to give everything a clean up, but I've also noticed that the bolster has quite a bit of wear here. I've just cleaned and sanded them because what I'm actually going to do is re-dye these bolsters and then clean the rest of the leather so it matches nicely. So that should look a lot fresher when it's done. So to make sure I don't get any dye anywhere I don't want it, once I've cleaned the leather down, I can then mask off any areas which need protecting. And then using some Colour Lock Leather Fresh, which I had left over from when I was running my business, I can then re-dye these areas. Just dabbing it on with an applicator sponge and drying it with a heat gun and a few coats should do the job. I always feel like it's little details like this that can make a slightly used car feel 10 times better inside. So it's definitely 20 minutes well spent making sure that these bolsters look 10 out of 10. And while I was doing that, Tom then went about taking off the under trays because we'd already scraped out some of the mud from inside them. There's no way that we're going to be able to get everything without removing these so once those have come off with a bunch of Torx bolts revealing so much more mud but at least now we're going to have proper access to make sure that we can clean these areas properly and get it back to how it should have been before it was mistreated slightly. Now annoyingly some of these bolts were pretty corroded and pretty nasty and some of them did round as we were trying to take them out so we had to do a bit of angle grinding to be able to get these out but as is with the case with this car every single piece we take off reveals a nasty surprise. <laughs> Ah! Uh. <laughs> 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 Alright, slow it down. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want oh my god. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you look a mess. Thank you. You look worse on camera than you do in real life. Thank you. <laughs> Tom definitely pulled the short straw there. <laughs> Now the good news with this is that now the car has all of this mud removed from it, it should at least be a bit lighter, meaning that it should be faster, but there is a lot of cleaning to do on these under trays as well, so the jet wash is gonna take care of that. And then it's back to the interior, which needed a really good hoover out to get all of the grass and mud out. And also all of the plastics as well were covered in dust and mud again, so they needed a good deep clean too. But in order to get this back to how I want it, these seats have got to come out because I want every inch of this car to be, as I said, as good as I can get it. And there's definitely going to be stuff hiding underneath those. So for the sake of removing eight bolts in total to get both of the seats out, it was well worth doing it in order to get these parts perfect too. And now the interior is really starting to take shape. So we're on the last finishing details to get this as good as it can possibly be, including cleaning down all the door panels and also doing a little touching job on the seat itself. This is from where the seat belt has been wearing at it over time from people pulling it off and on, which is just naturally going to wear away at the leather on the seat. Now, like I said, the leather needs deep cleaning, so we can quickly do that. And with that finishing detail done, we can have a final look at the interior. Well, that is a transformation of the interior. I didn't want to bore you guys too much with it because cleaning the interior isn't the most exciting thing, but I think we've done a banging job here. The leather, I think, matches up pretty damn nicely. You can't see where I've could and where I haven't. The interior the fabrics have cleaned up really well, the carpets and the seats. We've deep cleaned the steering wheel, which now looks gorgeous. There's only two bits in my mind which really let it down in here. The first one is the condition of the gear knob and also this pad on the handbrake here. Apart from that, that is now officially a super clean supercar interior, but it's a shame that the outside don't match. Still 
young, but I move like a Veteran. new deal to my lawyer. To it. If you're down in my management, I'm just warming up a way to lie. Old producer saw the numbers one. Settlements. Different colors in my baggy life. Chalk it up, talk of the town where you're talking up. Wanna get you a ring, are you tough enough? Wanna get you new things with your pockets, though. Run it up, I used to be quiet and out of luck. Now, a job like this is never gonna be quick, but after a full day's worth of dry ice blasting, the guys had absolutely smashed it out of the park, and the car is so much better than what it was before. And welcome back to Chris's Kitchen, and boy have we got some results for you today. So what we're gonna do is go through the first six first and establish which kind of leave-in and soak liquid has been best for cleaning our rusty and crusty bowls. So I'm armed with my ex's toothbrush. I hope she comes back. And I'm gonna give each one a scrub off. We have deliberated, haven't we, Thomas? Yes, we have. And this is important advice. This is why we're making sure that it's right for you guys at home. So shall we go from worst to best? Yes. Okay, so let's go. In place number six, we have vinegar. That's because it's pretty damn crusty still. The threads are still dirty. It basically did nothing apart from get it wet. And stink the house up. Damn right. Next up, number five, we have bleach. Basically, it won over vinegar just because the threads were slightly cleaner. Number four, WD-40. You guys probably can't tell on here, but it just looked a little bit cleaner than both of them. Not much more to it, to really. And also as well, is gonna go into any holes very nicely now. Then soda crystals did seem to have some cleaning effect. Still not loads, but as you can see on the face of the bolt there, there is some shine going on and that was all crust before. So a surprising one considering it's mainly water. Then it's their old favorite Coke, just because it seemed to take off a fair amount of the surface crust but uh, the thread cleaning capabilities, maybe not so amazing actually, Thomas. And then at number one, the one which I said is instantly the loser, unless it's a lot better, was actually a lot better. And that's because, I don't know if you guys can make that out, but it's almost like it's reacted with the rust. Let's shine some light on the situation. And that's what kind of like what they look like. Yeah, so that is a fair old difference. Now, if you are gonna do this at home, I would recommend not buying it in such small amounts and putting a lid on your container, but if you're just wanting to drop your bolts into something to clean it, acetone is the way to do it. In the real world, there is a real winner, isn't there? There is, and most car people should be able to do it at home. I'd say so, and that is the electrolysis method. So, what you have to do, battery pack, the negative terminal goes to a steel wire, which then touches the part you want to clean in water with soda crystals inside, then go into a scrap piece of metal with any sort of wire, I think, as long as it's conductive, to the positive terminal. And then you just leave it, and as long as the item that you're wanting to clean is bubbling, it's working. And you can see how much that has pulled off that nasty, rusty bracket from before. Scrub it. And how long has that been? It's been a day. That is almost like a new bracket. It's gonna need painting to protect it, though. Incredible, the difference there, I'd say. I think you could even possibly identify a part number. So that is a clear winner. Although a little bit more fiddly than the other options is by far worth the fiddliness. Yes, and it's very satisfying. The only downside is you've got to then deal with this mess afterwards. So some conclusive evidence for you right there on which method is best. And the electrolysis is a clear winner for us there, for definite. Now, I hope that's going to have been helpful for you guys and taught you maybe a little bit about how to clean your nuts. I hope you learned something inside Chris's kitchen, but now we need to go back inside Chris's garage to see how they're getting on with the dry ice blasting. Look at the difference on that. Now, there is naturally going to be limitations of dry ice blasting because you're using a non-abrasive material to clean. And I think there has been some overhyping on the internet about the capabilities of this. But it's done exactly what I needed it to do, so I couldn't be happy with the results on this. And it's now much closer to being ready for that full respray. So, as I'm sure you can see, the R8 has been transformed by the dry ice blasting and it's got it cleaner than I ever could have got it. But we do have some other things to make the R8 look a little bit better. And that is these here. You may remember in the last video we put some rust converter on the radiator brackets and the anti-roll bars, but decided it would be better to get these sandblasted powder coat, you know, whatever the process is, they've now been powder coated in silver, which look much, much better along with the wheels. You may remember these were in black and because we're going for that original factory look, the silver is much cleaner and I actually really, really like these wheels in silver and black. You couldn't really see the shapes of them, but in silver, 
I rate these, they're nice. And I've got to thank the wheel man for doing these wheels. He's based near Gilbrook Retail Park in Nottingham. If you're interested in having your wheels done, his links are in the description, along with the guys at the Ice Blasters. So if you need ice blasting or powder coating of your wheels or other items, you know where to get out. So now it's back on with the freshly powder coated anti-roll bar, but something wasn't right. Right, we've just figured out that we were trying to put the anti-roll bar in upside down. It's been a long day, you've got to give us some slack. It's like nearly midnight, so let's put the anti-roll bar upside down, then it will go on right. It's funny how much easier it is when you put things the right way around. Are we all happy that I've done that now? You peer pressured me into powder coating them, so thank you. I'm actually pretty happy, they look pretty good. Do you know what it's time for now? Coffee. Wheels, the wheels. Oh. And the final refurbished bit to go on is these 19 inch wheels. And I think these are a really nice shape now they're in silver. You can actually see the lines and the contours where in black it just hit it. So the first thing to go back on is this lower spoiler frame and then we can start attaching the rear spoiler again. Which is looking so much better after I restored it in the last video. So once we've got this plugged in and got all of the bolts in which go right around the edge, we can then put on the bracket which holds on the rear bumper too. Now that all of that's in place, the rear spoiler blade can go on, which is just held on with four 10mm nuts. Now for some reason, these door shuts are in satin black, but luckily it's in plastic dip, which means I can peel it off and the paint's undamaged. Now to fit up this kind of one section of the rear quarter, I've had to run and get some new clips from TPS, because, well, these are the old ones, and a lot of them broke when they came out. Now they are actually a different style, but I don't know if this is just a revised version of this, but these seem to fit quite a lot better anyway. So we can now start refitting some panels, starting with this lower quarter trim. So that just pops into place and then there's about 10 T30 bolts holding it on too. One thing that has surprised me with this R8 is how kind of hand built it is. There's shims and spacers everywhere, like you'd expect on a Italian supercar. So it's not as so Audi as you think, if that makes sense. But that's not necessarily such a bad thing. It just shows how different they are to a TT or any other Audi model. But anyway, now we're reassembling the air intake system and obviously cleaned out the airbox which was full of mud previously. And this is going to be a first for this car because so far it's mainly been cleaning and restoring, but now we have a new part to go on it. Okay, now it is time for the air filters and maps to go back in, but there is no way that I can put these muddy, horrible Piper Cross filters back in. But look, but luckily, the guys at Piper Cross have actually sent us out some replacements, which I really appreciate. So thank you very much to those guys. And we can get these on the car with some nice, fresh filters on there, which aren't coated in mud. That's a bit of a difference if you ask me. So we can fit the new Piper Cross air filters to the old math sensors once they'd had a clean up and then bolt this down inside the air box which for some reason feels like a huge step in the right direction. But now that they're in place, we can now screw down the top of the airbox and keep those enclosed and sealed and nice and clean. But the intake system on the R8 is massive and it doesn't stop just there, it goes all the way around to those silver fins that you see on the side of the car. So we need to fit all of the tubing and pipe work which goes to there and then we can fit the rear quarter over the top. Which is pretty easy to do, there was just loads of T30 bolts holding it in place in all sorts of funny locations, but once those are in, they're rock solid and it lines up absolutely perfectly. But now that that's on, we can then fit the last part on this side, which is the silver side fin and the fuel filler cap. So once that's plugged in with the drain hose on there as well, that then slides in on pins with a bolt at the top and a bolt at the bottom. Well, progress is looking good. We've got the rear end basically nearly fully reassembled. I'm not gonna put these vents back in yet because it's all gonna come back off very, very soon. But on the whole, I'd say we're about there on the back end. Now we've got to turn our attention to the front because that is still fully stripped down. So we need to get the bumper on. We need to sort the trims out back here. We have also got a anti-roll bar, which has been cut lovely <laughs> there. So we need to replace that. We need to get some drop links in. There's quite a lot to do on the front end, to be honest. It doesn't look like a lot, but there's a lot more than you think. All right, here is the new one. It looks good, doesn't it? It looks better condition than the old one. This is actually off a of V10, but uh, they're the same part number, so it doesn't make a difference. But we're going to try and feed it in. I'm not feeling hopeful. How about you? It's not going to work, is it? Look. I don't think so, but we've got to try it. Right, 
we have made the executive decision that we are not mechanics anymore. <laughs> We've given up putting the anti-roll bar in. We're gonna put it back together without it. It's not gonna be the end of the world. It's not gonna affect the way we drive the car for now. We just need to get it mobile again. So because we're working on a deadline, we need to get this car mobile today. And with doing that, it just seems like it's gonna push us way back, which is not what we need. So for now, we're gonna put it back together with a new battery in so it can actually start on its own and then we've got some more stuff to do. But before we do that, there's something which I want to do with the wheels because before these are driven on is the prime time to put a ceramic coating on these. I want to do this before the car's driven so one, it's easier to do and two, so it keeps them looking that fresh. So I've got some Revolvex wheel coating and some prep wipe as well. And ceramic coating wheels are super easy to do. All it is is a quick spray down with a panel wipe just to make sure the surface is clean. Um, unless your wheels are filthy, then they'll need deep cleaning first. And the same on the faces. Now you guys keep asking me where I get all of my detailing stuff from. I know you guys value my opinion when it comes to detailing products. And I haven't changed my supplier. I've been using my car cleaning for years and I'm still using them now. And they are also looking after you guys now as well. So there's gonna be a discount code and a link in the description for you to go and grab some bits to clean your car. So anything you see me use, that's where I get it. So now we can start on the front end, which means the first thing that needs to go in is that new battery so the car can actually start without a jump pack, which is much more convenient. And now to pop the front bumper in place, this again is super easy, it just locates into clips and then there's loads of T30 bolts all over the top, the sides, everything, but that's all that holds it onto the car. But it's definitely easier when you don't have to do it twice because you forget to plug the wiring loom in for the parking sensors and everything first. Next we can pop in the kind of front boot tub and that goes in just on a couple of locating pins and two bolts at the front. Which now means that all of the panels are on the car. That is some good progress made on the R8 and it may look at this point like it's nearly done. Unfortunately it's not. And there's one thing which I've got to do to be able to show you why, which I really don't want to do. Yeah, I've got to wash it again. I'm going to keep it brief for you guys this time because even I'm fed up with doing this. As quickly as that and luckily I've managed to do it just before the sun goes down but hopefully now you can see why we're not finished yet because this bodywork is covered in marks, chips and scratches too. It's hard to make it out because the car's still a little bit damp but it definitely needs some more work. But it's the sort of work that you just can't do at home so I need to pack my stuff and get out of it. R8 is now at the body shop and we have had a fairly uneventful drive down here until I arrived. We've noticed she's obtained a little leak of the coolant system. So we're gonna have to inspect what that is but the easiest way to do that is getting the front bumper off which we're gonna have to do anyway because we're down here at Evolve Accident Repair Center. Callum who painted the Golf, painted the i30N is gonna paint the Audi. So I've spent all day putting this car back together to have to take it apart again. Let's go. Which is unfortunate, but it's just part of the process. So front bumper is off again, but at least while I'm working on doing the strip down, Callum can get started on some of the prep work. So say for example, on the lower doors and parts of the rear quarters, there were signs of corrosion showing through, which is strange in aluminium, but it does happen. Okay, now we've got the bumper off, we can inspect our leak and I think I've found it just here. Drip, do a drip. But it seems to be coming out of this join here between the plastic edge and the metal core of the radiator. Which is never good. And the thing that makes it worse is I've just had a look on the second hand market and luckily there is one for sale. Unluckily it's a grand. So I'm going to have to try and find a cheaper option to either get that repaired or to see if I can get one custom made for less than a grand. It's got potential. It's just one of those things, it's an old car now, it's about 15 years old, so these parts are going to start wearing out. So we just need to replace them as we're going, but anyway, now we can get back on with the prep and all of us are cracking on with scotching up all of the panels around the back end of the car. And we need to remove any trims and also badges which are going to get in the way, like these ones. So the Audi badge can come off and also the P8 badge can come off as well. And I'm not worried about keeping this one undamaged because I want to replace it, obviously. At this moment in time, it felt like we were making pretty good progress. But I got to the body shop at around 5.30 and we got straight to work and it went quite a lot quicker than we thought. 
but there was some slightly deeper repairs to do on the bonnet. So while Callum did that, I set about stripping down the front bumper of all of its grills and wiring and hoses. And he sanded the deeper dents and filled those. But it always surprises me how much additional damage there always is when you're painting a car that you didn't realise there was. So filling in all of those stone chips and all of those minor little imperfections is a must. But I'll leave that job to the professional while I pull off the rear bumper, I think is probably the best idea. Because it would be a nightmare for me to mess it up and then the car gets painted and then it still looks rubbish. So we want to make sure all of the painted parts are going to be spot on. And like I said, there's always more than you think. All of the green marks that you can see here are probably stone chips. And then obviously the filler which he was then putting on is from the bigger dents which you could see quite clearly. But because of the repairs, this car's going to need some primer. Well, the time is now half nine on Friday the 8th of December. So the car is now pretty much scotched all over everywhere it needs to be scotched. We've sanded through the corrosion on the bottom of the doors, gone over the stone chips on the bonnet and the dent on there as well. If we can have a look at that, looking much better. And down here, more corrosion at the bottom of the door that we dealt with. And now we're going to put the car in the booth and get the areas primed, which need to be primed, ready for the car to be painted tomorrow. I think we're smashing this cow, don't you? He doesn't say much. Now we are on a tight deadline with this car because we have only got use of the booth over the weekend. After that, these guys are all going to go back to work and this car has got to be out of here. So we've got until Sunday to get this finished, which for painting a full car, ain't that easy, but I think we got this. Primer time, baby! So we're just gonna finish the masking off inside the booth and get some primer laid down and the reason we've got to do this is to cover over any kind of repaired sections so at the bottom of the doors the rear quarters and the bonnet have all got areas which have been repaired which means they need to be primed before they can be painted so we left this overnight to dry and came back in bright and early the next morning to get this car prepared ready to get it back in the booth and remasked to be painted properly but before it can go back in the booth we've got to sand down the areas which we've primed to make sure that that's perfectly smooth and also going to take the new paint properly and lay flat so Callum does that whilst I start prepping the side skirt. And these were a bit tatty, but nothing that we couldn't sort out. One of them had a split, but Callum managed to sort that off camera. So once the primed areas have been sanded, we then laid down a guide coat on these. What that does is helps you be able to see if the areas that you've sanded are perfectly smooth or not once it's been sanded again. So if there's any dark patches here, you'll see that it's not quite smooth. But luckily this time around it was. So with the final clean down, we could get this car inside the booth and get it masked up. <laughs> And the R8 is now completely masked and ready for paint. So we can start laying down some color. Obviously we've already panel wiped it to make sure everything's clean and free from oils and anything that could contaminate the paint job and make it look worse. So fingers crossed this one comes out well. So we've got one Audi R8 masked, sanded and ready to go. We've got our color mixed up and inside the gun. And we've got one professional painter masked up and ready to go. Callum, it's over to you. Don't let me down. And let me down, he did not. But just quickly before I leave you to watch these clips, don't forget to subscribe if you're not already on that final push now to get to that 100,000 subscribers before the end of the year.
first coat of lacquer is now on. I've got to run off now, unfortunately, so I'm going to check back in tomorrow morning. Hopefully, Cal can get some clips of painting the bumpers and stuff like that. Yeah, should be doable. And I'll see how this looks in the morning. now the next day and the R8 is painted. Now we have still got to flat and polish it so there's going to be some dust nibs in there but that is just part of the process. But while I was gone also, Callum spent the evening, maybe into the early hours of the morning, prepping and painting both of the bumpers and also the silver side blades too. So he was busy last night, safe to say, but uh, I really appreciate his hard work. But now we can start reassembling this and flattening and polishing it at the same time. So we need to be out of here today. I need to get a move on. So we're now on the final push to get this R8 back in its original form so we can get the side skirts on and then start reassembling the front bumper by putting all of the grills in, the parking sensors and also the headlamp washers too. And once that front bumper's completely reassembled, we can then bolt that back up to the car. Now this is going to have to come back off again in the future to fix that water leak from the radiator so I'm not too fussed about getting all of the trims and everything kind of finished off. We just want to see how it's going to look in its final form. But now that's done, I can refit the exhaust tips which I spent some time polishing whilst they're off the car and then also I can fit up the rear grills into that rear bumper before that goes on. Now this rear bumper has been made quite fiddly because someone in the past has converted the rear number plate lights to LED which do look better don't get me wrong but they haven't done the best job with the wiring so this might be another job which I tidy up in the future because it would be nice to have a little bit more cable there to make it easier to get the bumper on and off and fit the number plate lights without too much faff. But the rear bumper is now on, but there's one final piece on the sides which needs to complete it, which is those silver side intakes. So again, they go in on the push fittings, and then there's two bolts, one at the top and one at the bottom to bolt those onto the car. So whilst I was doing all this, Callum set about wet sanding and polishing the car. So he denibbed it and then went over it with 3000 to take out some of the texture and then polished it up nicely. And finally, we've got the car back in one piece. We've done some of the wet sanding and polishing, not all of it, there's still some to do but it is looking so much better. I need to get some new badges. There's quite a few other bits which need doing underneath the body of the car itself. So this project isn't finished yet. And also we've got that water leak which has sprung from the front radiator which needs sorting too. And by the way, I got a price for it and second hand, I think it's a thousand pounds. So I need to try and find a cheap alternative to get that fixed. But does it not look absolutely mega? It was well worth doing that. The car wasn't in bad shape, but every panel had a mark on it in some way, shape or form. And this car deserves to look the best it can, which I think now it does. You might think my Audi R8 is complete. Well, unfortunately, it's not. Because it's still missing quite a few parts to complete this car, and a lot of them are on back order, which is what I've been waiting for. But now they're here, we can get this car finished off and boxed off once and for all, and get it back to its completely original, clean factory specification, which we've been aiming for from the start of the project. So we can stick the car up on quick jacks, ready to start work on it and get it finished. Well, we've got loads of under trays and plastic trims to go on, but before we do any of that, I feel like this is now a logical time to do a quick service on the car and make sure that it's gonna be good for the next five, 6,000 miles without being touched. So that is where we're gonna start. But on an R8, that is not such a simple job. And that's because Audi R8s have a dry sump engine, which means they've got three sump plugs, which is much more complicated than your normal engine. So I think I'm right in thinking there's one here which is a little bit wet, which means the plug and the washer needs changing. There's one here and there should be another one somewhere else very nearby and I believe there's also a plug in the bottom of the oil tank in the engine bay as well so we need to drain all three of those and then we can change the filter and put some fresh oil in. It takes 10 litres this car which is nuts. No, 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 that didn't go so smoothly. Alright, let's leave that to drain for a sec. This is a little bit tighter than you'd hope. Let's see if it's going to be awkward. I missed again. Well, apparently Audi's a special tool for this, but it's also quite common just to cut down 
a spline. So uh, I'm going to take off some off the back, which will hopefully give access then to uh, to take that third one out. That should do it. And while that one's draining, I'm gonna crack this one off as well, so it hopefully makes it a bit easier. Let's see if it still doesn't fit. More trimming required. That is way too tight. No, not good. Yes. No, I can't get my spanner out. Come on. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad. So after a good battle with that sump plug and nearly rounding it off, I just managed to get it cracked off. And I'm really not very good at draining oil on cars. I just seem to get it everywhere every time. Now you can see why I've been struggling with this so much. I think what's happened is the splines have got full of dirt, making it really hard to get your socket in there. Someone's given it a try before, rounded it a bit, tried mole grips on the edge of it, which didn't work. But luckily by cutting that other one down and then pushing it in there with like a set of pliers and like levering off the, uh, the bar, I've just managed to get it cracked off. But I think it was very close to never coming out again without you know some specialist help. But we got there in the end. And now, because that one will never go back in, we've got three nice new sump plugs to go in. This really isn't the easiest thing to do, but hopefully whoever does this in the future won't have that same problem. I'm not sure why they made this sump plug so tricky to get to on this engine. It seems like a bit of a faff really, but I'm sure with the right tool, it's a doddle. Then this is the final bit that we need to drain. It's positioned very awkwardly because well, I think there's no way it's not going to make a mess, but uh, you know, we've got to do what we've got to do, I guess. Let's crack this off. There we go. Not as bad as I thought. Not as bad as I thought. Now we just need to change over the oil filter and pop in some fresh oil, and we should be good to go. We've already done the air filters because we've popped the new pipe cross ones in. The spark plugs are supposed to be long life ones and we've got a receipt for those being done fairly recently. Quite a simple service really, not as bad as you'd think. So now we've just got to pop out the oil filter housing which takes a 32mm socket so once we've wound that out we can just pull it out and swap the oil filter over. I'm going to try and save as much mess as possible and try and pull the oil filter straight into the drain pan. Three, two, one. Not too bad. So old filter removed, we've just got the O-ring to take off here as well, which should be relatively easy. Then a new genuine filter. So that should just clip in. There we go. This is just a preventative measure really because we don't know the full history of this car so it's better to be safe than sorry. Sort of like when you're buying a used car, you would never do that without checking it with Car Vertical. And now we can follow that with 10 litres of the good stuff. Because every used car has a story and this is the only way of revealing it. Right, so I've run the car up to temperature and all seems good. Oil level's sitting perfect after putting exactly 10 litres in and there's no obvious leaks. So that's a service completed. But you may remember we had a fault on the R8. When we got it to the body shop before Callum painted it and did a wonderful job, we had a leak spring on the way from the front radiator. Now, while the bumper was off, I just tweaked some of the tabs ever so slightly. And ever since then, I've not had the leak come back at all, which is great because that saves me quite a lot of money. But I want to make sure that this car is going to be solid. So we're going to pressure test the coolant system to make sure that that radiator isn't a weak point anymore. And if it's not, all good. And if it is, I'm going to send it off to be repaired. So my thinking here is I'm going to put it to a pressure which is still safe, but on a overly pressurized side of safe, if that makes any good sense. And I'm going to leave it for 10 minutes or so. So it's kind of higher pressure than it ever would be. And then if it does leak, then we'll know that it's going to leak. If it doesn't, then we know it doesn't. There we go. So I've set it to 15 PSI or just over one bar. And I'm going to leave that to chill for a bit and come back. Right, moment of truth on the pressure tester. And we can see she's still holding the 15 PSI. And underneath the car, 
dry as a bone. That's wicked. It must have just been a dry seal or something like that, but uh, it's holding perfectly now. So that has saved me a lot of cash. That is good news and we can move on. Okay, now that we're happy that this radiator isn't leaking, that means that we can button up the front bumper finally and there's just a few extra bolts to put in basically, but I'm gonna change out some of the nasty old looking ones for these nice new ones here. And well, I actually bought these for the under trays, but I thought not so important underneath, you don't see them as much. So these can go in the under trays, these can go in the bumper where you're gonna see them more. Makes sense. And now that we know the bumper doesn't have to come back off, we can fill the washer fluid up. Oh, oh God, it's not a good pour. Oh, and by the way, I know this video is being filmed before Christmas, but it'll be going out after Christmas, so I hope you guys have had the best holidays and made the most of your time off work. So this is how the trims look before I restored them, and this is what they look like after I've used g Technic C4 on them, and is that not a complete transformation? If you want to grab some of yourself that, I'll leave a link and a discount code in the description. So these trims sit either side of the engine bay and really tidy it up and definitely tidy it up even more now because they've been treated and looking proper. The next trim to go on is the door shut trim. Again, I've done the exact same process on these two. And then we can roll underneath on my new creeper and start fitting up the new under tray on the front. This is a brand new item. This is the one that was on back order. And then we've cleaned up the rest of them because they were looking pretty tatty after Mark had rallied them through his field. Now in the whole process of this, there have been a fair few bolts which we've lost. Now I did get some new ones from TPS with the under trays, but I think a few still went missing. So I'm gonna have to order some extra ones when they open back up. But for now, we can fit up this freshly cleaned prop tunnel cover. And I know what you're thinking, it's not mud that was either side of that, it is kind of like a seam sealer. I don't know if it's been kind of dyed by the mud that it's been driven through or if it was always that colour or not, but it doesn't just wipe off at all, let me promise you that. Right, under trays are on and completed and we've got all of the bolts in there, but that does open us up to another problem because I've run out of bolts. And normally that wouldn't be such a problem. I've got somewhere pretty much across the road which sells loads of bolts. You've got all the motor factors which are open, but it is now the festive season, meaning that everywhere is shut. So I cannot get any bolts to save the life of me. So I'm gonna have to make do with what I've got lying around for now and then swap them out at a later date. Hopefully I've got enough to put these in because I really do wanna go for a drive in it. So I had to make do with what I had lying around and get the under trays in place. Luckily the bolts are just M6s but they're not quite as tidy as the nice T30 Torx head bolts which they use from factory. And there was quite a lot of them which we needed. It probably about 50 or so bolts which we need to replace. I don't know why they use so many. It just seems a bit excessive, but it's just how they are. And there's nothing worse than having bolt holes with no bolts in them. But now we've got all of the arch liners in. One thing I do want to do is lower the suspension because Mark set this car for off-roading, which means the suspension was wound all the way up in the sky. And even though it probably wasn't actually much higher than standard, it'd be really nice to get a nice, clean, slightly lowered stance on this car to really complete the look. Now, luckily, those guys have done the majority of the work for me by fitting the coilovers. All I've got to do is adjust them. So I've just got to crack off the lower collar and then I can wind down the strut to lower the car and then I've got full adjustability of it. Now, the tracking on this car had never been done since the coilovers have been fitted and also since we had to remove the steering rack to fit the anti-roll bar. So one final thing that we had to do was take it to my local tracking place and get this car set up properly to make sure that it's going to drive in a straight line. But after weeks of hard work, we can now go for a drive drive.
This is my 2008 Audi R8 V8, which I've rebuilt. Now, I bought this car a few months ago from Mark McCann after he'd rallied it around his field, but he had the dream of jumping it, so stripped it apart for parts and then sort of left it. So he was left with a completely stripped and ruined R8, which was just perfect for me. So after a month of rebuilding this car and trying to get as close to perfect as I can, I think I'm now in a really good position to try and sell it. And because this car is HPI clear, that means in theory, it should be worth the full value. But today, we're gonna find out. So today we're gonna go to three different places to try and get the best price on selling my rebuilt Audi R8. So the first place that we're gonna go is We Buy Any Car. And this is the quickest way to get rid of any car besides burning it. And that's because We Buy Any Car will literally buy any car on the day, whether it's a rusty Corsa or a What's a cool car? Bugatti. A Bugatti. So although they'll take any car off your hands, they're going to be paying the bottom of the bargain bin prices for it. So although this is the easiest option, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. Wow. Okay, we are here. So let's see what the cheapest offer is on my Audi R8, which I rebuilt. So after hours of cleaning, rebuilding, and restoring my Audi R8, how much were we buy any car willing to offer us? Unfortunately, at this location, nothing, because we got kicked out for filming, even though the guy was super polite. So we decided to go to another location and stay more covert. So after arriving at location number two of We Buy Any Car, we tried to go for a second attempt to get a valuation on the R8. And this time we were successful. Hello, you're all right? Yes, you. Yeah, not bad, thank you. I was wondering, would you have to give me a price on my car quick? Is that all right? I've got right? all the documents and everything with you. I've got a photo of the V5. Give me a rough idea. Yeah, that'd be good if you could, that'd be great. So this lovely lady at We Buy Any Car had a look around the R8, but unfortunately, there was a problem. Because I haven't had this Audi R8 in my ownership for over four months, she can't actually offer me anything for this car today. But she did give me an offer if I was to come back in two months' time and sell the car then. 18.2. 18.2? Yeah. Okay. No worries. But we'd need you to go around it for four months. Yeah, so it'll <laughs> in, for, in two the extra two months' yeah. time, it'll, yeah, it'll change again anyway, won't yeah. it? Yeah. Okay, no worries. 18, but right now, we'd be looking at 18.2. 18.2, no worries. All right, thank you. Yeah, You're appreciate welcome. it. You have a great day. Look after yourself. So after getting kicked out of the first We Buy Any Car, we had to go to a second one, and they actually would not buy my car. So We Buy Any Car don't buy any car. But what they did say is because it's I've only owned it for two months um, since the V5's changed, and it needs to be owned for four months before they can buy it for money laundering reasons, which I guess is fair enough. But they said if that wasn't the case, they would be able to offer me £18,200 for this car. That's far too much money. <laughs> <laughs> right, to save a bit of confusion, in one of Mark's recent videos, he said that the R8 was his. That was filmed before I had actually paid him for the car. This car is paid for now and is mine so we can actually sell it. So the next way of selling a car, we're gonna take it to the main dealer. We're going to Audi themselves to see if they will take this in park exchange against a newer model. I almost think they might not, to be honest. Because of the age of the car, they might not even want it. It's a possibility. Hopefully, if they do want it, they offer more than 18,200 pounds, because that is a joke. Okay, we're gonna have to go potentially super covert on this. We're gonna ask for permission to film. If not, we'll have to pocket the cameras and leave the mics running. But the first thing we need to do to make our story believable is find a car that I'm interested in first to part exchange this against. How about this one? TTRS, 41,000 pound. Is that the the I think, RS3? I think this is it. Shibben Fibber. Shibben Fibber, oh my God. Shibben Fibber rat. That's actually pretty. <laughs> oh, is it rat? It might, it might be PPF. That RS3 is cool. Oh, damn. Is that like the same, that's the same RS3, isn't it? Don't got the carbon wrap though. I, I kind of prefer it with that, to be honest. I like that, that's smart. That is nice. The RS5, yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm a bit out of touch on car prices. Oh, oh damn. another R8. That's loads better than mine. 113,000 for I that. I don't actually think that's that bad a price. The engine looks exactly the same, apart from it's a V10, but like the actual... Yeah, that is so much better than yours, yeah. Chris. This one's nice. faster, looks cooler, it's okay. got more carbon fibre. I reckon you should try and say, like, I want to upgrade to this new... Suit me. So then you, it, mm, Does anything suit you'd be me? letting the look down a little bit, yeah. mate. 
Yeah. I, I feel like I'm way too much of a scrote for any of these cars. <laughs> <laughs> so, after deciding on the Audi RS3, me and Jack popped inside the dealership and got the attention of a salesman. And then we could start talking about how much they would be willing to pay for my Audi R8. After going outside and having a look around the car, the salesman then came back in to give us a price. Is the yellow suspension light on your dash when you start the car? Yes. Oh. Right. So, we don't know what that problem is. Because it's got a light on it, yep. we'd have to plug it into okay. our kit in yep. there, and then the boss can make it. Can we go on the presumption that it's fixed. not? Yeah, that it's fixed. Yeah, and then of course we can. So yeah, we yeah, can yeah. just do that, and then yeah. so I can get that sorted. It's no yeah. problems to you guys. I might actually have to buy the car now. <laughs> the coffee's too good. <laughs> and grub. Do you not want this it? Is, no, <laughs> no, no, no. This is a very tricky one. Okay. To value. You don't get these every day. Yeah. Even for an Audi dealer. He thinks it's around uh, 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 about 20. Okay. Yeah. That's what you guessed about. I did guess 20. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a, t it's a toughie. It's a nice car. You know, it's an early one, which is good because it's, you know, it's for nostalgia reasons. It's manual, you know, rare, manu manual, rare yeah. color. Yeah. Actually, I'm trying to sell this to you now. Yeah, I know. You don't have to. It's a lovely color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything, but it's, it's kind of a. And the other good thing about it, not molested. No, Original. it's very yeah. genuine. Yeah, yeah, you're right, it is genuine. So the lovely guy at Audi noticed that there is a warning light on, on the dash of the R8. And it's been a bit intermittent, so we need to try and find out what that is to get the most money for this car. So we're going to plug in our OBD11 reader and find out what that fault is. So all we're going to do is stick this device into the car's OBD2 port, and then with the car's ignition on, we've just got to fire up the OBD11 app. Hit connect, select the device, and then this will automatically detect that this car is an Audi R8 and then we can run a full diagnostics. And then by pressing this button here, we can scan all of the fault codes on the car. We're gonna read through 20 different modules to see exactly what the fault could be. And in total, we have 21 faults, which is a lot more than what I thought it was. Let's find out what they are. So it's saying here, the right rear level control system sensor is playing up, which means that one of my level sensors on the rear isn't right. So that narrows that down pretty nicely. I'm gonna have a look at the driver's side rear and hopefully that can clear my fault codes. But for now, what we're gonna do is clear all of the fault codes on the car, because putting a blanket over your problems tends to fix them. But OBD11 can do so much more than just that. Because for all BMWs from E-Series to I-Series and all VAG Group cars, OBD11 has a bunch of one-touch applications so you can turn on hidden features in your car. So say, for example, on this R8, we can change the startup screen on the radio. We can activate the mirror dip with reversing, so that means that your mirrors point down so you don't curb your wheels. And also the acoustic lock confirmation, so you can hear when you've locked your car. So to grab yourself an OBD11 device, use the link in the description and discount code SLICKS to save yourself some money. But now let's go and find out what the last place is gonna offer on my Audi R8. So we've done two out of three of the ways to sell this car and now we're onto the third, which hopefully should pay the biggest return. And that's taking it to a specialist performance car dealer. So we're gonna go to Motion 8 cars in the Melton area and see what they can offer on the R8. Now this place is a little bit special to me because I used to work for these guys when I was operating my detailing business and this is the first place where I ever detailed a supercar. It seems surreal coming back here to me because I remember the first time I came here I cleaned a baby blue Aventador which is like my dream car and also a Gen 1 V10 R8 GT in red and now I'm back here in my own R8. Is that not just nuts? So we're gonna see what stock they've got and also see what they will offer on my R8. Oh, whoa. And you can see, they've got some cars here. Nowadays, nothing really excites me. Only one of me and nobody like me. Phone ringing and I tell them it's I got wifey, y'all, I'm blinking she. Hey, Chris. How are you? How are things? Hi, mate. Hi, mate. Hi, dude. Everyone at home, this is Chris. So Chris and Chris, super easy to remember. Yeah, I'm gonna have a nose around quick. Yeah, it's been a while. I know, yeah. I feel so glad to not come in. I have to put my hands in cold water. No, yeah, especially, not, especially not today. I'm yeah. wearing the wrong coat as well. So there is some things which might be able to tempt me here, and I'm doing my best not to be tempted. I've never actually sat in a Rolls Royce before, Chris. Well, and I nearly went for the back. Help yourself. Thank you, mate. Look Has at it that. Umbrella check. Ooh. Where's the umbrella? Ah! <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> How suave is that? If you can't quite afford a boat, this is your next <laughs> I and definitely you, can't quite afford a boat. If you take off the carpet, Matt, look underneath your feet. He's you go, got wooden that. floors. <laughs> wooden floors. <laughs> That's nuts. I could do Monaco in this, definitely. Oh, I can't see over the bonnet, though. No. That's a bit of a problem. I have to jack the seat up a bit. I can get you a cushion. Yeah, I probably need that. <laughs> do you know what I couldn't do in this? 
take my hat off. <laughs> Everyone you, would see you my bald spot. What about me? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone would see my bald spot. Can you let me know if you crash it? <laughs> <laughs> the the trucky bottoms in Dirty Air Force don't quite work anymore. I think we'll swap keys. This is yeah, more you. That's definitely more me. You now we're talking. You fire away. Now that is nice. Now that is nice. But still out of my price range. What's this worth? 260. More than my house. Now, I know something about this one. M4, competition, 50th anniversary, badges. The one option that you want on one of these cars, interior please. Carbon seats. Oh. Yes, I've seen a set of these for sale second hand and they're 10 grand. 10 grand? 10 grand really? for the seats, yeah. Oh my God. This, is this an individual colour as well? I think it is. The Riviera blue. Yeah. Oh, is it? Now we're talking. This is definitely more you. And right? do you know what? The seats fit me perfectly. I'm just the right amount of fat for them. What's this, like 80-ish? Mid-60s. Mid-60s? Yeah. That's cheap. It, it, well, basically, it's 52 because the seats are worth 10 grand. Uh, <laughs> right, enough window shopping. <laughs> so, we want to see, obviously we've got a book price of what the R8 is worth in Park Exchange, but we know the history with this car, we know it's had a bit of a hard life, so we want to see how good my repair is. Obviously the car's not categorised, so there's no evidence of the repair being done, but we want to see how much you would catch me out on. I know Chris, looks pretty moody. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would be like the, the main things that you look out for on one of these? Um, first of all, when I'm dealing with cars of this sort of age, it's tallying up mileage, because old R8s and old Lamborghinis, people can fiddle with the... Uh, yeah with the clocks and it's easy to do so you always tally up the the seat edge and the steering wheel wear it should work out about that sort of mileage that's just on an initial you yeah, want, yeah you have to get a car like this on the ramps and check i would say that's held up again it's audi so audi everything is quite tough that would tally up that sort of mileage okay whatever you've done you've done a good job yeah but uh yeah listen what you've done it's 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 held up well Shh. <laughs> you didn't see that. <laughs> now that's I a, heard something. This is a common thing on the R8. It's, it's a little bit loose. So they've got the same mirrors as a TT, and when people take them off, there's a bolt in there which just always snaps. Yeah, little bits of cosmetic things don't really concern me. There's a bit of paint over there on the plastics at the back. Again, you can feel the edge. You can see the line, the orange peel effect on the edge. Yep. It's a strange one. How, how do you get... Um, Mud on the inside of the lights. A clip to the clip of Mark driving it through the massive muddy puddle. <laughs> it's definitely not been off-road. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rear lights seem to have had um, some action. Yes, they've, uh, again. Action. This is really annoying. A very expensive light lens is cracked. Whoever did this is in big trouble. This one was from being pushed. Okay. <laughs> and I think he dropped it there. <laughs> yeah. Again, these are all these are all things that can be done, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Nothing that's going to cause any. Uh... But I presume that would affect the value slightly. It would. It would. But then again, for what it is, like I said, everything has a value. Yeah, so yeah. Maybe we'll just chip you a little bit on the price. But yeah, probably. again, it does depend <laughs> on which car you're going to buy, whether it's the <laughs> super fast or the dawn. <laughs> yeah. All smooth. It's, I think it runs well for all things considered. I've never heard one that's run as well as that. Doesn't sound too bad to me. I don't know, the dashboard and everything looks really clean. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I'm sold. Right. Let's see exactly how much my R8 is worth then, with all of the damage took into consideration, because it's the only fair way of doing it. Yeah, look, we know the history. <laughs> You know, the paintwork, the owners, taking into the taking all these things into account. Like I said, the lights, it's all these little telltale signs. But like everything has a price. Um that the warning light we'd need to check, there's a couple yeah. of things, but really I think we would take it as it is. Twenty one thousand. It's better than Audi's price. Yeah. Better than Audi's price, yeah. Yeah. And how far? Uh, <laughs> there might be a Ferrari up there or a Lamborghini, <laughs> which could be interesting. 
And like yeah. I said, as a part exchange, it depends on what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do something for you. But yeah, okay. we'll take that in, Chris. So there we have it. Three different offers on the Audi R8 at a trade value. You've always got to bear in mind that's going to be considerably less than selling it privately. But none of those ways are how we're going to sell this car because on the 11th of February, we're going to be meeting back up with Mark McCann, not only to show him the car, but also to try and sell it because he's opening up a car dealership for the day. So if you do want to come down and check out the R8, the link's going to be in the description. That's all for this time. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, don't forget to like it. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're not subscribed already. And I will catch you next time.